money, Monero. I'm a cypherpunk hero. I don't care about no profit. I don't care about the narrow. Every hash rate, fuck a baker, so I'ma keep it running. Every hash rate, fuck a baker, so I'ma keep it going. Solo money, Monero. What is this Monero con version 2? I'm Howard Chu. I'm here to talk about decentralized mining in Monero. And um, I'm going to skip over these intro pages. You know, if you don't know who I am, you can you can ask Google. So what do we mean by the topic of mining decentralization? Why does it matter? And what have we done to achieve it? That's what we'll talk about in this. So the big question is why? Why do we care about this? And uh, I suppose the answer requires, you know, looking back at where all of this started. So Monero uh, is based on CryptoNote, which, you know, was designed sometime before 2014. You know, there's some claims that the first white paper was written in 2012 or 2013, but basically eight, eight or nine years ago. And the CryptoNote design, you, you know, was, was written to address a lot of flaws that showed up in Bitcoin over the years. Uh, Bitcoin was intended to be a permissionless, you know, person-to-person -person electronic cash system. And uh, experience showed that it didn't really behave like cash. You know, pseudonymous accounts weren't private enough. We're not as private as cash. You know, a lot of the parameters built into the Bitcoin software, uh, like the fixed block size, uh, were severely hobbling the network. And most importantly, you know, it was supposed to be a decentralized system, which grew into becoming heavily centralized. And you know, again, what do we mean by that? We mean decentralizing control, decentralizing power. You know, if you look around you at the world today, you see centralized financial systems everywhere, and they're uh, they're so easily abused. Anytime you centralize power, it's easily abused. You know, there's there's reports about um, you know credit card companies that are cutting off businesses from their services so that. Those companies can no longer accept payments from their customers. And the same thing happens with you know, payment networks like PayPal. You know, they, they have strange terms of use where if you accidentally violate one of them, they'll freeze your accounts, you know, freeze your funds. Uh, you know, the banks themselves, you know, not just the payment processors, the banks themselves will do the same thing as well. You know, we have, again, multiple examples of that in recent history. If you remember back to the Canadian truckers convoy that uh, was demonstrating against the COVID vaccine and people were sending donations to, to those truckers and the banks were freezing their accounts. And people were sending Bitcoin donations after the bank freezes start happening. And, you know, the Canadian government started trying to freeze those payments as well. So uh, you can see that there's many examples in the real world today where you know, all of these centralized systems are subject to the whims of you know, the governments in charge, the people in charge. And so you as the individual user, the individual citizen, you don't have total control over your finances anymore, over your property. And so again, Bitcoin was developed to, to combat that abuse of centralized power. And it really has failed to deliver on, on that promise. And if you look at how Bitcoin mining developed over time, you know, it was only for a very short period in the very beginning that Bitcoin mining was done exclusively on PCs, on CPUs. And then, you know, because it used such a simple proof of work algorithm, the SHA-256 hash, uh, you know, it quickly got adopted onto uh, GPUs and then GPUs dominated for a couple of years and then people realized, oh, you know, we can start building 
we can we can program FPGAs to do this, and they can be even more efficient than GPUs, you know, because you don't have to carry all the unused graphics hardware that the mining hash doesn't need. So big efficiency boost from that, and then eventually you get into the pref uh, professionally built commercial ASICs, and from there, you know, the the hobbyist miners have been left in the dust, and all of the mining power has been focused in you know, a small handful of companies, in particular, they're, they're the companies that actually build the mining chips themselves, the mining ASICs. So the first commercial ASIC was released in February 2013, and it, and it was modest. It only had a 50 times performance advantage over CPUs. But, um, you know, if you fast forward to today, and modern mining ASICs are millions of times more efficient than CPUs. Uh, so a, another effect of having these specialized chips, you know, it, it directly promotes centralization, you know, it completely defeats the goal of decentralization. Uh, these, these specialized chips are never easily available to the general public. Um, and part of that is because the, the people who build these chips tend to keep them and, and mine for themselves before they even bother to sell them. So whatever they sell to the general market is already the previous generation, the obsolete chips that they no longer have a use for. And, you know, in contrast, you know, you can buy CPUs from a bunch of different companies at pretty much any shop around the world. So you find that you know the the dynamic in Bitcoin mining or uh, anything that's ASIC dependent is self reinforcing. You know because the ASICs themselves tend to be scarce. You know they get concentrated into a small number of hands, a small small number of organizations, and you know as as an individual person, uh, it's extremely difficult for you to participate in that mining network. Uh, you know, if, if you buy like one or two ASIC miners, you, you're you not going to get any appreciable return on that cost. So there's, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of real life consequences to this lack of decentralization. Um, you can look again in the news just, just earlier this month, the state of New York passed a ban against crypto mining. Now, as of a few days ago, that uh, that bill hadn't yet been signed by the governor. I don't know what its status is now, but you know the the legislature had already passed it. And we can look um, just a few months into last year, where again China started uh, banning crypto miners in that country, and the effect in China was pretty drastic. Um, as you can see, just over the course of four months, from April April to July, uh, all of these proof of work based blockchains experienced massive drops in their hash rates. All of them except Monero, which in that same four months, hash rate grew by thirteen percent. And this shows you just you know, very vividly the the significance of having. Uh, a centralized mining as a weak point in your blockchain, in a blockchain whose sole purpose is to decentralize power. You know, ASIC-based mining, centralized mining is a massive weak point um, in your system. So one of the things you can draw from that chart is that, you know, what we've done in Monero to strengthen decentralization has actually been working. It's been extremely successful. So now we talk about how we've done this. What has Monero done that has actually worked so well? And there's two elements to this that we'll talk about. First of all is the actual proof of work algorithm, which if you've been following along in the past couple of years, you'll know it's it's called random X and uh, it was developed specifically for Monero. And this other system that has been growing recently, it's a more recent development called P2Pool, which is aimed at decentralizing mining pools. 
So we'll talk about both of those. Just to give you a little bit of history on how the mining hash rates in Monero were working out over the previous few years. Um, you know, the, the first proof of work algorithm for CryptoNote was called CryptoNite, and it, it worked pretty well for Monero all the way up till 2017. During the, the massive crypto boom of 2017, uh, it became apparent that mining ASICs for CryptoNite were being used on the network and they were taking over the hash rate. And you can see from this chart, you know, between the end of 2017 and early 2018, the hash rate increased pretty drastically. I can point that out here. And when we discovered this, you know, the developer community in Monero decided, well, we're going to try and break those ASICs because you know, we don't want ASIC mining to dominate the network. So there was a hard fork in spring of 2018 where we deployed the first variation on Kryptonite. We call that uh, Kryptonite version one. And that lasted for about six months until the next uh, scheduled hard fork when we released another variant called Kryptonite version two. Unfortunately, you know, Kryptonite version two was only a, a small tweak to the algorithm. And again, by the spring of 2019, there were a six mining version two algorithm. And so we knew, you know, we knew in 2018 that, you know, just making these tiny tweaks to Kryptonite was not a sustainable proposition. You know, it was, it was good as an emergency response, uh, as a short-term response, but it wouldn't keep, keep the network safe going forward. So um, we started developing uh, a random code-based proof of work algorithm. So that, that work started in 2018. Um, and it took a while. You know, it took a while to get the work completed and tested and have security audits performed. Meanwhile, in 2019, uh, we did another hard fork and we released Kryptonite version four, which was borrowing some ideas from the random X, which still wasn't complete, but was rapidly taking shape. So Kryptonite version four, released in the middle of 2019 and it looked it looked like it was going pretty well um, there was actually a lot of resistance in the community to deploying random x because you know from what we could tell by looking at hash rates kryptonite version 4 was still working but as, as it was you know these these long debates ended and we deployed random x on the monero mainnet in november of 2019 and you can see here where the, uh, the hash rate changes because uh, the random X hash rate and the kryptonite hash rates are not directly comparable. But one of the things that we learned after the fact was uh, there were in fact ASICs for kryptonite version four in development. And you know, if we had, if we had decided not to deploy random X, then they, they would have dominated the network again. So just to give an idea of you know, how RandomX works or what, what the design approach was, the main, the main goal here is to develop something that CPUs are best at. So we wanna look at you know, what, what is the task that CPUs are designed for? And they're designed for running programs. They're designed for running arbitrary programs. So we decided to develop a a uh, virtual CPU with its own instruction set. We could randomly generate code for this CPU and execute it. Of course, to actually execute it means we have to translate it into the native code of this, the real CPU that we're running on. But in doing so, uh, we wind up using most of the major functional parts of a modern CPU. And this, you know, this focus on randomized code 
uh, and fairly complex code is is really the reason why RandomX has succeeded so far. You know, previous proof of work algorithms have all been based on single purpose uh, functions. You know, SHA two fifty six hash or some other very single purpose code. But you know, CPUs aren't built to run just one thing, and and in general, you know, a CPU doesn't ever run any single thing uh, very well. It can always be optimized in specialized hardware. So the strength of the CPU is to be able to run anything. And to exercise that strength, you need uh, either a huge library of code or to dynamically generate random code. So that's the approach that we took is to generate code randomly. In comparison to some other proof of work algorithms that were in use before, you can see, first of all, the, um, the simplest SHA-256 and, and some of these other hash-based uh, algorithms, they actually have no complexity, no computational complexity to them at all. You know, they don't do random memory accesses. They don't do complex math. Um, all they do is you feed data in one end and they crunch it and data comes out the other end. You know, that's, that's the basic operation for SHA-256. Uh, the X11 and X16 algorithms, all they do is take 11 or 16 different uh, hash algorithms and string them up together in a sequence. So they're, uh, they're not any different from a single hash algorithm in terms of complexity. So Kryptonite and fHash, you know, were the first to try to actually attempt to be ASIC resistant and they relied on memory hardness. So they relied on the cost of randomly accessing data in main memory. And Kryptonite kind of, you know, fell in 2017 because the amount of RAM it was accessing was only two megabytes. You know, that, um, that turned out to be easy enough to fit onto a specialized chip that um, the memory hardness aspect of it was, um, was defeated. FHash has lasted a little bit longer, but you know, even today there, there are already FPGAs and ASICs that are at least two times more efficient than the GPU miners. So again, you know, it's it used a large amount of RAM, say four gigs, eight gigs, I don't know what they're up to now, but whatever the memory size they settled on, um, it became practical over the course of years to, you know, to build chips with that much memory access. So again, fHash hasn't held up all over time. Randprog was, was my proof of concept for a randomized proof of work program algorithm. And you know, it was based on not just data accesses, but instruction accesses. And you know, this is again, the, the key part of a CPU that any other ASIC doesn't have. You know, most ASICs don't have instruction fetchers because they're just uh, performing hardwired operations. And so this was the first element of complexity that we added to it. And then also we added uh, floating point math. And, you know, again, most proof of work algorithms won't even touch floating point math because the majority of floating point operations will return imprecise results. And, you know, imprecise results means you, you don't get a usable hash result at the end. So that would be uh, pointless for most for most cases, but you know we've we've refined and uh, restricted the range of these operations to guarantee that they always return exact results, and that's how we make use of them. Uh, Kryptonite R, as as I mentioned, it borrowed some ideas from the work we were developing in Randprog, but uh, it was still very simple because it was it was designed to fit in the memory footprint and the verification time of the existing kryptonite algorithms. So uh, in terms of overall complexity, it wasn't that great. And then there's uh, ProgPow, which was developed as a replacement for fHash. Um, I don't think it's ever actually fulfilled that purpose, but other, other blockchains have adopted it. 
And um, again, their idea was to generate random code, but they're generating random code for GPUs. So it's, it's again, a different kind of a dynamic and it keeps GPUs in the game, uh, which isn't necessarily a good thing. So we have RandomX, which uh, takes the complexity of all the previous ideas and bumps it up a notch. I won't go too far into how that works. Um, you know, my entire Monericon presentation three years ago was about RandomX, so you can always look that up if you want to see more details. So today, uh, RandomX is you know very mature. It's got full support for x86 and ARM. Um, there's even without that. Uh, intrinsic support, you can still run it on other CPUs if you want uh, in interpreted mode, which will be at least 10 or 20 times slower than the native mode, but it, it's doable. All of that code is fully integrated into MoneroD now. It's been running on mainnet since November 2019. And you know all the indications that we've seen so far, there's there are still no ASICs being developed for it today. Of course, uh, it does actually work on GPUs, but uh, the efficiency is at least you know, two times worse than on CPUs. So I don't believe anybody is practically running on GPUs right now. So as I mentioned before, you know, we didn't know at the time that we were developing Random X, but uh, there were ASICs for Kryptonite V4 already existing. So there, there really wasn't a lot of choice going forward. You know, if we decided to stay on Kryptonite R, Kryptonite V4, uh, the network would have been taken over by ASICs again. And it's funny to to look back on that time because you know lots of skeptics were claiming that. As easily as ASICs were developed for Kryptonite, they would easily be developed for RandomX as well. And you know, again, those people had no idea what they were talking about because the, the the difference in complexity between these algorithms is so great. Uh, you know, there was there was never any chance that was going to happen. You know, not within eighteen months, not within twenty four months. Um, so nowadays. Uh, you know, back then the AMD CPUs were the best, and that's still true today. They're still the most efficient. Uh, it looks like Apple's ARM chips, the M1 and M2, can be very competitive uh, in terms of efficiency. Uh, the problem is that the the Apple OS, the Mac OS software, is just very unreliable, and so you get um, pretty inconsistent results on the Mac platform right now. There's there's also another interesting chip to look at, the, the 5800X3D, which has what they call 3D vCache on chip. And you know that expands the on chip cache by at least a factor of four. And ordinarily, you know, that would be a great thing for a memory hungry, memory intense algorithm. It turns out that that doesn't have a huge benefit for RandomX because, you know, again, RandomX was designed for a system with a two megabyte on chip cache. And most of the memory operations that RandomX performs fits in that two megabyte window. So throwing more than two megabytes of cache per thread at the algorithm doesn't really boost its performance because the, you know, the extra cache memory isn't going to get used. And when you expand the size of a cache like that, you're making it four times bigger, it, it actually gets a lot slower. So latency goes up, and so you don't get a lot of performance benefit. Now that could change going forward. You know, if if the trend going forward is that you know on chip caches get much larger as they as they do this way, where instead of relying on two megabytes per thread, we can count on say eight megabytes per thread, then you know, we can retune RandomX to utilize that cache. And uh, then it would start to make a significant difference. So that's it for the proof of work algorithm. 
Now we'll talk about pool decentralization. And you know the, the big point about mining pool decentralization is you know there's there's a fear that as any mining entity gets to a large percentage of the network hash rate, then they can start you know launching attacks against the network. And we call these 51% attacks. Although technically you know, these attacks can succeed at much less than 51% hash rate. Uh, so last week when, uh, when I was preparing these slides, the, the network uh, hash rate looked kind of like this, where myNXMR.com had 43% of the hash rate. And uh, the next two or three mining pools had 14 15%. And then the P2 pool mining pool, which I'm going to talk about, had 6%. And you can see that um, you know, mine XMR is definitely you know, the, the number one by a large margin, more than twice the, the number two mining pool. And so there, there is a danger here if if the administrators of the mine XMR pool decided to get uh, malicious, you know, they they had the opportunity to attack the network either by you know mining empty blocks to try and slow down transactions, or uh, maybe to try and perform a double spend attack. Um, now, you know. Historically, MineXMR has been a very great supporter of Monero, and they've had no tendencies to, to try and attack the network. But you know, it's again, we see how easily centralized power gets subverted by uh, you know political changes or other things. And so, we really just don't want to be in the position where anybody has that opportunity to launch an attack. And that's why P2 Pool is such an important part of this picture. So what is P2 pool exactly? And funny enough, it's like so many things that Monero has adopted. It was originally developed for Bitcoin and then uh, the Bitcoiners abandoned it. It's a merge mined side chain uh, with a relatively fast block rate. And because of the fa uh, fast block rate, uh, it has a pretty high frequency of orphan blocks. And this is actually the characteristic that led to it being abandoned by Bitcoin project. Um, so S. Chernick, who was you know, one of the three of us who worked on RandomX, uh, he, he took the P2 pool stuff and rewrote it from scratch. And then he also uh, added a fix for the orphan block problem. It's called uncle blocks, which is a concept that's used in Ethereum. You know, Ethereum also has a very fast uh, block rate. And uh, the, the point behind uncle blocks is uh, they allow orphan blocks to be, uh, to be tracked. So they're not just lost and their hash power discarded. They actually still count for your mining reward. Um, the first general release of P2 pool was uh, last fall, September 2021. And you know, it's been growing steadily. You can see that. From then till now, it's um, it's only been what six, nine months, and you know now it's six percent of the network. And just to to get an idea of where P two pool fits in things, uh, you can you can see how how it differs and how it's similar to other mining approaches. So. Prior to P2 pool, you know, you had two choices. You could solo mine or you could mine in a centralized mining pool. And uh, if you mine in a centralized pool, you know, the benefit you get is you get pretty regularly scheduled payouts. Of course, partly part of your mining proceeds get paid to the pool as an administration fee. And that could be, you know, zero to three percent. But uh, after the fee is deducted, you, you can generally rely on you know, getting paid uh, on a routine basis. Of course, you know, you're relying on a centralized infrastructure then. You know, the mining pool has their own set of servers. 
that are controlled by the pool administrator. Um, if those servers go down, then you know your miners aren't able to do anything unless you know you redirect them to some other mining pool. Uh, the the big advantage, aside from the regularity of payouts, is that you only need uh, a mining program, and you can just get started. You can tell it your wallet address and tell it the pool server address, and off you go. It's really easy to set up. And then as an alternative, you can solo mine, where if, if you successfully mine a block, you get all of the reward yourself instead of sharing it with all the other uh, pool miners. But you know, the, the probability that you'll actually mine a block is small, so the frequency of your payouts will be extremely rare. Uh, but again, the advantages for solo mining is it's completely under your own control. You know, you run your own Monero node, so stability is up to the stability of your own network. And um, block selection, transaction selection is all up to your own node. And you can actually solo mine just with MoneroD all by itself, or you can optionally you know, use a third party miner. And then we get to P2 pool, which tries to you know, give you the advantages of both of the previous approaches with none of the disadvantages, or hopefully none of the disadvantages. You know, be, because you are mining in a pool with other miners, that means your payouts are more frequent. They're on a regular schedule. And with P2 pool, you also pay no pool maintenance fees. So uh, it's like solo mining in that regard, where whatever reward you get is completely yours. There's, there's no administrative overhead uh, that you're paying for. The minimum payout is, is much smaller because you can get paid more frequently even than with a regular pool. It is completely decentralized. Uh, Everything, again, depends on your own node. It's completely under your own control. Your own node controls all of the block selection and transaction selection for the mining. Now, it's a little bit more complex to set up because you know, you, in addition to needing a Monero node, you also need to run a P2 pool node, and you have to run a third-party miner. You can't just um, use the Monero node's built-in miner for this. So the, you know, the reasons to use P2 pool, it's fully decentralized, it's fully permissionless, and it's fully trustless. There's no pool administrators, there's no central server, there's no one else to, to pay. Uh, there's no pool wallet, and you get payouts directly from the blockchain in the Coinbase transaction. The payout scheme is called PPLNS, pay per last end shares. And so, um, any shares that you've mined or that you've hashed successfully within the window, which is 2,160 pool blocks, will count towards your payout if a block is successfully mined. Um, the payout that you get is proportional to the total difficulty of the number of shares that you had in the mining window. Again, you get paid directly from the Coinbase transaction. Now, as a consequence of this, uh, it only supports mining to a primary address, not to sub addresses. And since Coinbase transaction addresses are public, you know, for your own privacy, you should always use a separate dedicated wallet for P2 pool mining. You know, keep that separate from your main exchange or spending wallets or whatever. Um, and interestingly enough, the, the code in P2 pool has a more advanced transaction selection algorithm so it tends to construct blocks that have a better block reward than MoneroD would construct by itself. So while we call P2 pool a merge mine sidechain, in fact, uh, you can have as many sidechains as you want. Um, there's, there's two built into the code, the main one and the mini. So the mini sidechain is for miners with a much smaller hash rate. You know, like if you're mining on a couple of smartphones or something, you might want to use the mini pool instead of the main pool. 
but anybody can start a side chain if you want to you know start your own local mining club or something with your buddies um, you know you could set up your own side chain for that and as of the latest uh, version 17 Monero release, uh, P2Pool support is now integrated in the GUI. So it should be a lot easier for uh, newcomers, less techy users to get involved. And that brings me to the end. I think I ran a little over the time, but... Uh, got a lot of random nexus. This ain't extremism. This is more like economic terrorism. Back, back, give me 50 feet. We party hard with our politicians. Money making missions, but this is not about materialism. I'm solo mining, I'm so underground. Straight up up out of the trenches. You can block my transactions. I'm still gonna validate it. If we talking about central banks, then you know that I fucking hate it. In my black air force once, I'm not worried about no ASICs. Keeping you mining back to the basics. Economic red pills out the matrix.